Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you and praise you for this day that you've blessed us with. As we come to you tonight, we ask, Lord, that you would touch each and every person, not only in our county, but around this world who is battling this illness. We pray that you would put your hand upon them and let healing be swift. Lord, tonight in this meeting, we pray that you would bless it. Let it be, God, with meekness and humbleness, God, that this meeting goes forward. Pray that you would touch our commissioners. Thank you, God, for sending them and blessing this county. We pray that, Lord, every speaker that would speak tonight would speak with humility and kindness, God. And we pray that in all things that we say and do, that tonight that you would be edified and glorified for it all as we give you the praise and honor and glory for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. This is for uh, June 2nd, 2020, special pre-agenda meeting. June 4th, 2020, special meeting me meeting met, uh, minutes. June 16th, 2020, regular meeting. July 27th, 2020, special pre-agenda meeting. July 7th, 2020, special meeting. 20, uh, July 21st, 2020, special regular meeting. And July 23rd, 2020, special meeting. Chairman, I move all those. Good evening, Lindsay. Hey. I'm next. Um, Vocephus is um, about three years old. He is super, super playful. He gets along with everybody. He loves children. Um, he just needs an active home, so if anybody wants a hiking partner, um, and he is really, really cute in his hat. <laughs> <laughs> and then our cat is Snow, um, who also partook in the costumes. Um, Snow is a ragdoll mix. Um, he's a really, really beautiful, very sweet cat. He's super playful. Um, he's pretty young. He's under a year old. So he wants a house where he can have lots of things to climb on um, and hopefully a playmate. He gets along with other cats as well. Um, so those are our pets of the month. Um, we do have lots of others available at Animal Services, and we encourage everyone to come down and foster, adopt, or volunteer with us. 
Questions or comments? How many pets are, are we not putting in pet sound now? We're able to find homes for them or send them off? Uh, we've there. not had to euthanize for space um, in quite some time. Um, I would have to look back at our records, but I believe it's been, you know, since we started in August. Um, okay. Now that excludes sick or injured, that kind of thing. questions or comments from Lindsay? Obviously y'all were doing a fantastic job in being able to get the adoption rate up where it is and um, I just want to commend all of you for, uh, for doing that. That's a real group effort when working with our friends in the community. So I would uh, remind people to come see our, our folks at Animal Services and please adopt these wonderful animals um, down there and especially uh, those cute animals that, uh, um, was it both Cephas and Snow? Yes. <laughs> okay. And so uh, please, uh, uh, I would encourage people to go down there and uh, open your hearts. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you for your support. Fantastic. Okay, our next uh, presentation, community development. This is concerning the Jonas Ridge Country. I just wanted to briefly give you an update and the uh, public on our uh, Jonas Ridge Convenience Center and Recycling Center as well as the Cranberry Nature Park. So as you all are aware, we've been uh, on this mission for uh, two years. I believe we've been talking about doing something up there for two years and doing something for our friends that live up on the uh, mountains that seem isolated from the rest of the county from time to time and they have taken a great interest in this uh, project. I mean I have to say I've been very uh, pleased with the uh, support from them with the input that they've provided to the uh, people who work at the convenience site as well as at the uh, country store up there uh, on the mountain. So we've actually been quite busy and we signed an agreement with Equinox Environmental as well as McGill Associates to do a study and to do a plan on how we should develop the land up there. So we purchased, the county did, three acres and we came before this board and asked for uh, money to purchase that from Hazel Shell. And then we worked with our friends at Foothill Conservancy and they purchased 17 additional acres. So that is adjoining and that is the property where the bog is. So they have an interest in preserving that bog and that very sensitive uh, natural feature that is actually a rare Appalachian feature in the mountains. And they purchased 17 acres, altogether we have 20 acres. And so it takes a whole lot of background work and a lot of studies in order to get you to where you're starting to do designs like this. And these are the rough renderings and uh, sketches and plans that were done. But in order just to get to that, we had to go through a process. And let me share just briefly some of the things that we had to go through. So we started with data collecting and base mapping. In order to do that, we had to seek out aerial photographs of the land in the area. We had to look at the National Wetland Inventory and we actually went on site with boots that came up, you know, high up here and we walked through the wetter areas and we started looking at the types of water, the hydrology, the contours, the vegetation and the actual things that were on the site and it had to be determined before Foothills could actually get Clean Water Management Trust Fund money that there were certain things in place that makes this worthy of preservation. So if those things didn't exist, they would not invest the money or move forward. So we did a lot of studies on the wetlands, the delineation of the wetlands, uh, looking at the designated waters. We did archeological, uh, site visit with uh, some specialists and we also looked at the historical significance of things. We looked at the soils that were there and took soil sampling. We uh, 
wanted to know if we can uh, uh, use the site for bathrooms and other things like that. And we also wanted to know if the site itself would support heavy trucks coming in and out. And there'll be additional studies on that as we move forward. Uh, we did look at the vegetation and the drainage patterns. We had to know the drainage patterns because we're separating uses. So we're using a very intense use with the convenience center and the recycling where everybody brings their trash and waste versus a very sensitive environmental uh, section where we have to protect and make sure the water is clean. So we also did an assessment to see if there were any cranberries and or, and or bog turtles. They're still looking for bog turtles to see if they're there. The cranberries initially have not shown to be there right now. But we know for a fact that they were there and that they were on the entire site because so many of the people from Jonas Ridge used to go there and they used to gather cranberries and they used to actually fish there. So I learned by accident that that little pasture that's out uh, front showing where the main convenience uh, center will be located actually used to be a pond and that when they uh, upgraded the road up there on 181, they filled it in. And I was talking to some older men up there and they said, I used to fish in that pond. I said, well, that's, that's amazing. We'd have never known that. <laughs> so <clears throat> you, you learn a lot as you go. Um, the second thing we did was a preliminary conceptual design that included uh, doing services that can be provided uh, at the convenience center. So we spoke with a lot of people in the area to see how much traffic we actually do up there, what types of things can be done. And keep in mind, you have to have a market for these material, uh, for these things to be recycled. So we often have a lot of people that would like to recycle products, but there's not a market. So if we gather them up, we can't sell them or do anything with them. And unfortunately, they wind up in a landfill, a municipal waste uh, landfill, or if they're not toxic or household in nature, they could be in the CDC type of landfill. So we, we looked at a lot of those things. We did some stormwater uh, uh, And we looked at safe and efficient ingress and egress from 181 onto the site. Even though we have great sight lines, that is a location where traffic picks up speed. And some people are driving 60 miles an hour up there. So there is a little concern by folks of how fast they go. And a couple of the comments from maybe we should look at uh, putting some sort of warning light or something that there's traffic coming in and out of the uh, convenience site, maybe a solar powered uh, uh, high visibility beacon or something of that nature. Uh, let's see here. So the Cranberry uh, Nature Park, we did the same thing. We looked uh, at trails and where trails might be located. We looked at parking that would utilize these things, utilizing low impact development techniques and criteria. They did some measurements on the uh, bog with some recommendations of natural and cultural resource interpretation as well. Now, one of the most important things that we did was the stakeholder uh, engagement. So we brought up diagrams and we left them at the convenience uh, center. I've left the diagrams outside. Right there is one uh, that shows option A and what the convenience site itself would look like and what is being offered in our first uh, rendering of design. And so we had about 25 people who actually took the time to write down uh, things. We gave out over 225 uh, handouts 
which is really amazing up there at uh, Jonas Ridge. I used to live up there, so I know what a big impact is, and that's a big impact. And so people came, and then they made comments on what they would like and what they would utilize at the sites. So in general, and to be brief, we had an option A, which you see up here uh, with some of the uh, amenities, and we had a concept B. So these two things are based on uh, two different scenarios. Concept B is based on us being able to purchase an adjoining piece of property that actually splits the pasture in half and the rest of the north part of that parcel is actually part of the bog as well. The bog comes up and it wraps around so it's about half wetland. Um, 22 people out of 25 said they want concept B. The other three didn't mention which concept. They said either one is fine uh, as long as uh, something comes up there. The facilities that would be utilized the most, of course, is the convenience site and disposing of uh, waste. The other thing that people liked were the trails and the ability to get out and about. They hope, in general, that this will remain more of a local place to go and walk with the dogs or friends or family because they're saying that the crowds are now so bad around the Limble Gorge and at the Limble Falls and those areas that it's becoming not as enjoyable as what they're letting me know. So we have two concepts and let me quickly just tell you what the difference is. So concept A is based on the three acres that we have now. There would be a single entrance and exit to both the convenience site and the community center. The convenience site is 25% larger than the current one and it offers expanded services including a rough box, white goods bin, and used oil drop off. This plan has a small engineered wetland to treat runoff from the convenience site. And then the larger concept, Scott, can we bring up uh, B? Is B, and this is the one that everybody uh, wanted. And the reason they like it is, I'm gonna come over here and point to the mic, is we have two ways in to the convenience center, in and out right here. We're able to separate the traffic to the bog and the one direction road entrance here. Thank you so much. And by separating it out, we help keep trash and other problems away from our sensitive environmental part of this uh, project. And then we would have uh, parking and stuff for the uh, trails. There would be uh, sitting areas, things like that. And you all know me, I can't wait for studies to be completely done. So we've already studied, started working up there on the site. And the first thing we did is there's a old house on the property. You see it uh, right over here near the community hub. And we're, we've uh, had an architect in there that came and it was a bit dangerous so we couldn't go inside very well and look at it. So I've had uh, general services tear up all the additions that were on the house. So they had built brick additions that were falling down everywhere and the roof was collapsing. So this past week, we removed all of those additions and they have cleaned up the site and made it safe all the way around the house. They've grass seeded it and uh, did some, just a little bit of rough uh, grading. Our next step will be to bring in general services to clean up inside the house and then we're ready for the next phase of an architect. We know that one of the first things we're gonna to have to do is replace the roof on the house in order to dry in and protect that structure. But it's a, it's a prominent feature up there. Everybody knows the house when they grew up. They thought, boy, that's a wonderful thing. And we're looking at doing historical photos in the house as well as determine what other uses can it be used for. So it will have public bathrooms and that kind of thing 
It will serve as a small uh, visitor center, but we won't have it staffed with a full-time person, but we'll have handouts and other things that show what's in the area and, and things of that nature. So that's where we're at now. And the next uh, steps that we need to do will include uh, finalizing a uh, master plan uh, for this site. And Equinox, I was on a conference call with them uh, this afternoon. And the next step will be uh, cleaning up all these things, taking all the comments, and providing those into a book and a master plan that shows the different options. So we know that option B is what people want. And oddly enough, I had a call from one of the heirs of the property. We've been looking for the, figure out who the heirs are for six, eight months at least. And one of them called me north of Chicago just a, a couple days ago. I guess it was Thursday, last Thursday. And he said he's very interested in selling the property. He didn't even know he had it until an attorney sent him a letter saying that your grandmother, uh, uh, Margaret Schell, uh, happened to have a connection down there. And he said that he'd always heard that there was a connection. Unfortunately, 10 other people have showed up on that heirs list. We don't know how many of those are alive or well, but only one of them's in North Carolina, and she's at Jonas Ridge, and I, I know where she is, so I'll be swinging by to see her. Uh, the others are in Georgia and some other states, but what he's trying to do is a quick claim deed. He's gonna pay off all the taxes that are owed, do a quick claim deed, and then whatever they sell it for, they'll distribute to the heirs. So we hope that that will work out. Of course, if the land gets bogged down too long, we won't be able to go with option B, but the master plan addresses option A and B, and we have done site analysis for both. And so that's my update. I'm happy to answer any questions. The answer is it depends. <laughs> it depends. It's a JR answer. It's a lawyer answer. Uh, <laughs> if we were going with A in the next budget, we would ask for money to uh, do the design and engineering and actual construction of phase of, of this design here of the convenience site next year. But we think we want to wait and not rush it and see if the other can play out and if we can do option B. It will be a much better project and a much better thing to have if we can do option B. And it's not a whole lot more money, you see, because mostly it's open space and it's design. So you're able to spread things out into a, a better place. If we have to wait for option B, then it depends on how long you all want to wait before we give up on trying to acquire that land and move with this. Either way, we'll have the basic design, engineering, site analysis, wetland delineation, all that done and ready to go this year. So, so a minimum about a year. processes might take? I know it's open question there. Uh, no, not with 11 heirs. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it's a bunch, but this gentleman, he seems very organized and very with it, and he says that that's the desire. I'll be back to update you as we
Lifetime EMS Gold Plus Award presented by Jason Black, our Interim Emergency Medical Services Director. Share this recognition with everyone. Uh, the American Heart Association each year provides an award um, to a very high functioning EMS system. Which, and the next year we got the gold award. The reason we got the silver the first year was that we had to have the gold award or the silver award first so we've got it for three years in a row and I want to emphasize that this is a EMS system award it starts with um, telecommunicators first responders EMS staff and then our closest cath lab that we transport to is Fry Regional Medical Center uh, we've invited some of those representatives here we've got several EMS employees here um, due to COVID and other concerns the other representatives couldn't be here. Um, to get into the nuts and bolts and what the award actually is and some of the data of it, um, Nicole Carswell, she's one of our lieutenants and she's going to go briefly over what exactly the award is because it's, it's um, quite an impressive award. When hospitals get stroke care awards or when they get um, cardiac awards like this, those are the ones you see on the billboards going down the interstate advertising in hospitals. So, pretty proud to have this. Uh, Lieutenant Carswell. Commissioners, Mr. Steen, thank you for, again for having us. I'm going to echo most of what Major Black said, but this is the American Heart Association's Mission Lifeline Gold Plus Award. This is our third year receiving it. It is the highest honor that an EMS service can receive for excellence in pre-hospital cardiac care. So what that translates to, and without getting into the, all the health care terms, the words that we like so much, what that translates to is the citizens of Burke County have the absolute best cardiac pre-hospital care they can get. We have a premier system. We provide excellent, excellent pre-hospital care. There are four different measures that have to be achieved to receive the Gold Plus Award. And you have to achieve those measures greater than 75% of the time. So basically, you have to get a C on those, on those measures. The first one is the percentage of patients greater than 35-year-olds that get an EKG. We achieve that approximately 93% of the time. And there's a lot of variables to that, but we are significantly higher than the standard of the metric that they put for us. We like to do that less than 10 minutes. If you can achieve that in less than 10 minutes, 75% of the time, you can get the gold plus. That's what the plus is for. Burke County does that in five minutes and 55 seconds. That's our standard time from the very first time we arrive on scene. That's putting the truck in park in the patient's driveway to getting that EKG finished. Um, it's pretty, pretty impressive. That's pretty quick work on our part that, that our paramedics are doing. I'm not sure that anybody gets it that quick at their doctor's office, <laughs> which that's just the difference in what we do. The second measure is the percentage of patients that are having a heart attack that we activate what we call our STEMI line. That means we, we notice, we recognize the heart attack on the EKG and we activate that response system. You might have to do that in less than 10 minutes. We have 100% compliance on that measure. And that measure is probably the single most important recognition and activation of those systems is, is the single most important measure that we can put into place to make sure that patients don't end up with negative effects on down the road. The third measure is first medical contact that's a paramedic with eyes on the patient is what the, is what that means to vessel inflation vessel inflation is when the clot is either moved or removed and blood flow is restored to that part of the heart we want that in less than 90 minutes first medical contact to vessel inflation in less than 90 minutes and I want you to understand what that actually means 90 minutes is the length of a Disney movie okay that's the, the length of, of a movie that your children or grandchildren will watch that includes patient assessment, that includes the paramedics getting on scene, that includes loading the patient, that includes transport, that includes getting them in the hospital at FRI, on the cath table, and that procedure complete in less than the length of a time that we would take to watch a Disney movie. Um, our standard transport time to FRI, if we were to need to transport a patient to FRI from right here, that's a 23 minute drive best we can do. 
So a large percentage of that 90 minutes is taken up with drive time. Um, all of us know Burke County very well at 511 square miles. It's a large county. If you were to drive from Jonas Ridge to the Hildebrand Ockard area, it's an hour top. It's an hour solid. So we have a very, very large response time that does eat into our 90 minutes and we consistently, greater than 95% of the time we meet that metric. We are at the hospital and have that vessel open within 90 minutes. The fourth measure that we don't have as much control of but that we still activate very quickly is if a patient goes to CHS Morganton or what most of us locally know as Grace, if they go to Grace Hospital and they determine that they're having a heart attack, we still get them to fry in the cath lab in 120 minutes. So in two hours from the time that patient drives themselves to the hospital, we get them to fry and that they have blood flow restored to that part of the heart. Again, we're greater than 95% compliance on all of our measures and the American Heart Association says we have to have 75%. So we are far and above what our standards are. And we can only do that because of a team effort. It starts when the patient calls 911 and the telecommunicators answer that call, goes to our bystanders, noticing someone that is, is maybe potentially having chest pain or just doesn't look good and they call 911. Our first responders, I hope that nobody in this room has to use our first responder system. Um, it's never a fun day when you have to call an ambulance, but if you do, I want you to know that you have the most aggressive first responder system in, in the state of North Carolina. Very, very good first responder system. They do a lot of the work for us, and the patients are typically ready for a brief assessment and transport once EMS gets there. After that are paramedic and EMTs. Um, we have about 115 employees that do top-notch care. Very educated, highly trained, very good at what they do. Hospital staff have a very coordinated team with the hospital at CHS Morganton and then the hospital at Fry. Our race coordinator, April Traxler, at Fry Hospital, she is a phenomenal resource. Our county is grateful to have her as, as a resource. And then special thanks to, to our commissioners, Mr. Steen, for allowing us to continue to our growth and improvement with our EMS service. Um, emergency services, emergency medical services is vastly changing. Right now we're in, in a, a high growth we have a high growth opportunity and y'all allow us to continue to improve daily and we appreciate that. Any questions? Thank you. Any questions or comments? Yeah, just a comment I would say. Mr. Taylor. Uh, oh yes, it's on. Thank you. Uh, talking to someone about this about, uh, about two weeks ago, I guess. But anyhow, they made the comment that you're very fortunate to get one of those every 10 years. It's very significant that you get one for three straight years. Yes, it is. So you really have uh, made Burke County proud, and most of us never think about a heart attack, but to know that you got that kind of service in this county is just that's phenomenal, and we appreciate it. I appreciate the dedication and the work that y'all do and, uh, and the speed in which you do it, so thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? And I'll, I'll echo what Commissioner Taylor said. It's comforting knowing we have such a great emergency services uh, uh, division, and y'all do a fantastic job, unsung heroes. And, you know, we, we, we don't have to think about those, uh, what y'all have to think about day in, day out. And so um, um, just very proud of what you, uh, all of you have accomplished. Um, do we, we have somebody that can take a picture, Kat? Okay. If uh, would you have everyone up here involved, please, uh, I guess, get in front of the uh, seal and socially spread, and we'll have, uh, <laughs> so it might be a wide lens, and uh, we'll allow you all uh, to all be recognized. We really appreciate it. Again, uh, we commend all the all the work, the hard work you do, and especially uh, Kay with the hard work trying to get a picture uh, with everybody socially distancing. So, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> okay, moving on to item number four: uh, National Hunger and Homelessness Awareness Week, presented by Charlotte Eaton, Executive Director, uh, the Meeting Place Mission. And hopefully, did I say that last name correctly? 
Edson. Edson, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. I just I, I went the wrong direction, but I understand as more. <laughs> I can weed, always tell when a telemarketer's <laughs> calling. <laughs> <laughs> I have a last name that often gets mispronounced. Right. I apologize. So thank you so much. I don't know where. Thank you for having me, commissioners. Um, national Hunger and Homeless Awareness Week is a national endeavor by the National Coalition for the Homeless to promote education, action, and awareness about hunger and homelessness. On behalf of Burke Cares, a collaborative effort of continu continuum of care and nonprofit agencies in Burke County that address the issues of hunger and homelessness. We want the community to be more aware of the issues in our area, those who are less fortunate, and to help be an active part of the solution in addressing these concerns. Hunger and Homeless Awareness Week is November 15th through the 22nd this year. And this year we will be creating a media education campaign on rural homelessness to be able to spread and activate more education from our community. We appreciate the support of, your com of our commissioners and our efforts to address hunger and homelessness here in Burke County. Thank you so much. Thank you, any you questions, questions or comments for Charlotte? Uh, I think we're all aware here um, uh, that uh, there's an acute need uh, for uh, for everything your uh, your group is doing and other other agencies, I, I know all of you at the Meeting Place Mission, and y'all do great work, and so do our other agencies in the community. So we thank thank you for everything you do for the, our, our, our needy in the county. I appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We don't have a salvation army like a lot of counties have, which take care of a lot of the homeless and the hungry and. What do they do when we have no more places to put them? Is there a, an emergency shelter somewhere that we don't know about? Or do you ship them to another county? No, it's the other way. They're shipped here most of the time because of the resources that we have here. Um, but, you know, we do have an emergency shelter for women that is located here as a part of our services. Um, and then, of course, we have the men's transitional home. So what we try to do is really work um, to get people either to keep them home in home because that's obviously cheaper um, and more resourceful and then also just try to continue to use the services of all the collaborative effort that we have here um, and just continue to work together we also work in a regional view as well with the surrounding counties so mcdowell um, caldwell and catawba all um, we have a monthly meeting that we reference uh, the need and different resources that are available if Burke County doesn't have something. And the same thing for those surrounding counties. They try to pull from our mental health and um, other uh, nonprofits that we have here in Burke County. Good. Appreciate what you do. Thank you. Charlotte, one other question. Yes, sir. Um, the point in time count that we showed in 2020 was, was 33. Mm -hmm. that, that number seems down, but uh, it doesn't seem down when I, when I look around. Uh, how do you feel about that number? Do you think the, the pandemic impacted that count? Or? I did, um, and I mentioned that to Kay after. Um, I believe one of you asked a great question when we did the pre-agenda. Um, that count does seem low to me, and I, I, I have a feeling it has a little bit to do with COVID because I looked even years back, and 2018 was 77. Uh, 2017 was in the 60s so um, this is a reference point that the country uses as a way to kind of get an idea of how many people but a lot of what happens is are these agencies come together and um, offer gifts and offer um, different types of services on that one day to try to pull people out some people don't want to be recognized as homeless for a lot of different reasons and mental health is also another piece of it so trying to capture the number of people is, is hard to see. Um, but I, I would say, I would feel better about saying, you know, in the 60s as an average is probably the number of homeless that we have here. But we're trying to work to move that needle and reduce that as much as we can. Yes, sir, thank you. Anything else? Thank you so much. Sir. Yes, thank you, sir. Do you need a motion? Uh, do, please, sir. <coughs> Thank you, Commissioner Taylor. All those in favor, um, signify by raising your right hand. All right, motion carried, 4 0. All right, moving on to scheduled public hearings. Tonight we have none, so we'll move on to 
Item number eight, informal public comments. Madam Clerk, do we have anybody signed up to speak tonight? I do not have any cards, Mr. Vice Chairman. Okay. All right. Well, we'll just move on to the consent agenda. Item number nine, uh, turn it over to the county manager. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. You have five items on your consent agenda. Number one, clerk reappointment to Drexel Planning Board, ETJ. Item two, community development, approved purchase of Fontaflora OVT easements. Item three, JCPC, reappointment to seat number one. Item four, tax department tax collection report for September 2020. And the final item five, tax department <coughs> release refund report for September 2020. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I make the motion that we approve all five consent agenda items. Thank you, Commissioner Taylor. All those in favor of Commissioner Taylor's um, motion, please signify by raising your right hand. Motion carried 4-0, Madam Clerk. Let's see. Moving on to items for decision. Uh, we have none tonight, gentlemen. Um, so that will move us on to reports and comments. And I'll open that up for um, our county attorney, Mr. Simpson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, since the last meeting of the commissioners on September 15th, I've been involved in uh, the following major projects. Um, I have reviewed the documentation for the Unix Packaging Building Reuse Grant Agreement on behalf of the county. I have uh, drafted and prepared a local grant agreement for Unix packaging. I have reviewed a proposed construction agreement with Phoenix Fabricators and Erectors for the water tank and booster station at the Burke County Business Park. I have uh, completed a review of the proposed agreement with IT Partners Plus for the uh, DATO computer backup and disaster recovery system uh, recommending certain changes to their base agreement. Um, as I mentioned last month, we received an offer to purchase certain county surplus property. Uh, after your approval of that last month, we prepared and filed the appropriate legal ad. The offer uh, which was originally for $20,500 has been upset three times and now stands at $24,255. The time for upset uh, of the latest bid expires tomorrow at 5 p.m. unless it is upset before then. I have been working with the Sheriff's Office and the District Attorney's Office concerning a uh, response to a motion filed by a pretrial detainee. In the course of uh, researching procedural due process issues and the jail's protocol for uh, pretrial detainees, I have determined ways to update and upgrade our policies regarding this, and I have filed the county's response to the motion with Judge Urban of the Superior Court. Um, I have reviewed proposed uh, guarantees pr submitted by the Health Department for TV ad placement concerning COVID issues using federal COVID funds. I have reviewed and proposed changes to a memorandum of understanding with the uh, Burke County Tourism Development Authority for the Fonta Flora Trail Facebook page. I have uh, reviewed the proposed memorandum of agreement among local and state agencies regarding um, our court's continuation of operations plan for Burke County and also a memorandum of understanding concerning alternate facilities for the court system. I have filed suit against uh, Robert Lee Cook and Robert Franklin for violation of county zoning and county environmental compliance ordinances concerning the junkyard on Iron Lane. I have filed suit against Garland Britton for violation of the county environmental compliance ordinance concerning abandoned mobile homes and solid waste on Catawba Avenue right outside of Rodez. I'm preparing to file two additional suits, one for violation of the county zoning ordinance and one for violation of the county's 
um, environmental compliance ordinance. And that's my Thank report. You. Thank you very much. Madam Clerk? No comments. Any manager? Happy and safe Halloween. <laughs> you got a very scary office up there with those, <laughs> the way you have it decorated. Commissioner Abel? Thank you. Commissioner Taylor? Mr. Chairman, just uh, two items. Uh, in addition to what you already have uh, from my regular meetings, I attended two ribbon cuttings within the last few weeks. Um, uh, one with the Chamber for Sisters Act Cleaning Service, a unique cleaning service where they come to your house and to your place and uh, do cleaning. And the second cutting was that ribbon cutting was that speakeasy at 100 Stone Place, Morganton. And that was on October 16th. That's thank, all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Britt? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I would just comment uh, uh, concerning DSS. Uh, our board met uh, this uh, morning. And uh, just to make you aware that uh, since March, we have uh, continually had uh, significant increases in food and nutrition services as well as energy services. All this, I'm sure, related to the, to the pandemic. And uh, I just want to commend our department for the way that they have managed this uh, significant increase in, in demand at the same time when they're dealing with, just as all of our other departments are dealing with COVID and all the, the extra things that uh, have come along to, to, uh, to deal with. So uh, just be aware that our DSS folks are hard at work and meeting the needs of our citizens. Thank you, Commissioner Britton. And a couple of uh, announcements I want to make. Early uh, voting sites and times, uh, October 19th to the 23rd, 8 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. October 24th, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. October 26th through the 30th, 8 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. Uh, October 31st, 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. Um, and the early voting sites are Board of Elections Office at 2128 South Sterling Street, Suite 100, here in Morganton. The Burke County Senior Center at 501 North Green Street in Morganton. The East Burke Senior Center at 101 Main Avenue West, Hildebrand. Uh, the Glen Alpine Town Hall, 103 Pitt Street. And Rutherford College Town Hall at 980 Malcolm Boulevard. So please get out to vote. Um, and I would also ask the viewers to uh, like us on Facebook. Um, and we were talking about a convenience site earlier, so that puts me in the remind to our citizens, please don't litter and please help by picking up any trash you may see. Uh, and I also will remind our uh, folks to please spay or neuter your pets. And one last uh, reminder, county offices are closed, will be closed on November 11th for Veterans Day and November 26th and 27th for Thanksgiving. So uh, with that being said, uh, I will turn it over to Madam Clerk for vacancy announcements. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman, members of the board, citizens. We have the following opportunities for citizens to be involved in county boards and committees, the Adult Care and Nursing Home Community Advisory Committee, Council on Aging, Juvenile Crime Prevention Council, and the Board of Adjustment and Planning Board for the City of Morganton for the ETJs. The Voluntary Agriculture Board and the Burke County Senior Center Advisory Council and the Recreation Commission. Thank you, Madam Clerk. And I would um, just echo what uh, uh, Kay had just said. I would uh, encourage citizens to become involved. There's a lot of opportunities, great opportunities to get out and help your community. So uh, uh, thank you very much. Um, Moving on to item number 13, closed session. We have no need for closed session tonight. So uh, item 14 is a uh, motion to adjourn if we have one. So moved. Okay, we've had well, we're two. That's all I'll move in favor, signify by raising your right hand. All right, thank you very much. I hope everyone has a wonderful Halloween and stay safe.